Well, Fano, um, my message is a is a report back of the trip that you prayed for me every day, and um, and God bless those who did the twenty one day fast. I didn't do the complete twenty one day fast. I did miss meals, and I was praying with you along with you with our prayer sheet. But obviously, I was ministering, so I couldn't do the whole thing. So, thank you. And, and uh, congratulations to those who completed the fast. Um, you know, something's happening. And you might hear, you know, the chaos that's happening in our city, but, you know, that's only looking for, through a keyhole. God's doing the Arunui. There's a big picture of what God's doing. And your prayers are not in vain. Your prayers are stirring something up for the glory of God. So don't be moved by what you see happening in the natural. Be stirred by what's hap- what you're doing in the spiritual. Lift lifted prayers to God of heaven to bring blessing and change to our community. And it's, it's happening. God bless. Okay, so um, the first uh, PowerPoint, uh, please. Uh, so um, again, this is Michael and uh, Natasha Turner of Red Rain Ministries, who ministered uh, minister in twenty states every year. So they're about to launch on their state uh, their ministry. Uh, I think August, I think, and um, and they minister in. Ukraine and, and war zones, and they have a band, and they just, why a red rain, I said, and they said, because it's of the blood of Jesus, and it's the reign of his mercy. They're a rock band, but, uh, but they've got you know, Christian values. It's if we preach, no one will come, but when we do bands, we play outside nightclubs, or in nightclubs. He said that we were in Monte Carlo recently, and we played outside the nightclubs in Monte Carlo, and the nightclub, one of the, the nightclub owner came out saying, I don't know what's happening with me, but I'm feeling something going on in here, and I'm loving it. And he said, well, that's the presence of God. He gave his life to Jesus, nightclub owner, and very wealthy people in Monte Carlo being touched by the presence of God. All around the world, they see this. They see this with refugees in, in, in uh, Ukraine and war-torn nations. The presence of God comes upon people and gives them hope and they give their lives to Jesus. So uh, they bring greetings to you and they'll be with us on um, uh, November this year. So that's that's where I was staying in Sacramento for the first 10 days. Next one, please. Um, so you ever heard, I hear the train are coming, coming around the bend. Da, 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 da. And I'm stuck in Folsom Prison and and the time going. That's Johnny Cash sung that song in Folsom Prison. And uh, I clicked, I remember that song, so I got to go to the prison and I uh, didn't meet Johnny, but uh, Johnny C, he's a buddy of mine, you know, he's out of prison, I'm out of prison too. And uh, so it just, this is a bit of trivia, this is spiritual, over, so to speak. Um, then I went to Alcatraz Prison, which is uh, the m- most notorious prison in the world, apparently, and it's called The Rock. And I got to walk through there and just see the, what, the degradation of human humanity without God. It's just, it's just chaos. And uh, so it was incredible to walk through that prison and to walk through as a free man. For such, by the grace of God, I would be in a place like that. But by the grace of God, so I thank God. So anyway, next one, please. Uh, right, things really are bigger in Texas. You all, that's called a tomahawk steak. It looks like a roast. It'll feed my whole family. I didn't eat that. By the way, I didn't eat it. Too big. So I had a smaller steak. And uh, yeah, and what's that on that car? Those things, I have no idea. But you know, you're not going to ride your bike close to that car. And you're not going to have any curbing, are you? But I said, are these legal? They says, yep. Oh, well, we don't know. But uh, yeah, all the hoons drive around with these things on. It's just, it's just a crazy place. It's amazing. I love Texas. So I was 10 days in Sacramento, and, uh, which is about an hour and a half inland from San Francisco. And I had uh, three churches I was preaching at there. And then I flew down to Houston, Texas, and I was preaching three times at a Vietnamese church in Houston. So I was on assignment, and the assignment was to see if God wanted me to open wells of, uh, war- of the warrior activist training course, to see if God wanted me to open wells and to uh, serve, the, uh, to lift up the ministry of believers in the United States. And so three churches invited me in, uh, four churches actually. So next one, please. So um, this is the first church, and uh, that's uh, Sean and Dana, and they're going to come here one day, and you're going to share his testimony. He was a drug dealer. He was a bad dude back in the day, and uh, he got shot by another gang uh, drug dealer, and he's got an incredible testimony. His father was a pastor at the time, and his father was praying for him. And he said, he said, my son's in danger. He's on death's door. Uh, pray for him. And Dana was part of the, his father's 
church, and she was praying, not realizing that was going to be her husband in the time to come. And so, so I went into this church, uh, uh, Oak Church, I think it's called, and God opened the heavens over me, and I just saw the past, the present, and the future of what God has, was doing with that couple and with that church. I don't get that all the time, and that was a powerful word that just made them weep. They're still processing it. And um, God did miracles there. People were healed of long-standing diseases. Diseases just came off people, and they were healed as I stood there. I just saw miracles wherever I went. God, Jesus just began to do miracles and healings. But that is a church that they want me to come back and do a Warrior Activist course there next year. So I need three Warrior Activist courses to do but that would help cover my airfare there and back. So... So if you can continue to pray, if, that, if God wants me there, that he'll open up the doors for me to do three to four warrior activist courses next year. Cut boy. Next church. This is the second church. Uh, this is a, a Slavic church. Slavic means pe people that come from the Russian Ukraine area. And they escaped when the war went down. They escaped uh, Russia. They escaped Ukraine. And when I went into this church, I felt this fire behind me. I looked behind me. There's no heaters on. And we usually when I feel heat behind my neck, it's the angels. It's these warring angels. And, uh, and as I stood there uh, musing on this, the Lord said, yes, some of these people here in this congregation, the only reason they're alive is because the angels protected them in the war zone. And they know that they are here protected because of God. He says, so tell them you felt their angel. And uh, many of them put their hands up and says, yeah, without God's help and without his, without his angels, we would be dead today. And so it's a very, uh, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Slavic church. They, you know, they're Russians, ex-Russians, Ukrainian. They're very straight in your face. They're uh, not necessarily very emotive, but they're, mm, they're like that. I like that. <clears throat> yeah, I like that. Even the woman like that. And they tell you straight up what they want. But, but, yes, sir. Yeah, amen. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I was in that church, and then the, the Spirit of God began to move and began to heal people where they were sitting. And, um, and then I'm talking through the translator, and, uh, and, and I'm talking about how, um, about the sacrifice of praise and what it costs. And and I was just sharing, testifying, and using my message of how we, how God helped us through our journey with Kelly's passing, and how uh, we learned how to bring Kelly's death to the Lord as a sacrifice of praise, as an honor for His glory. And we still have pain, of course. It's not denying the reality of your sorrow and your grief, but it is bringing it before the Lord and saying, "I was still going to praise you. I'm still going to worship you." And it's a sacrifice of praise. And as I was sharing this, my translator breaks down, and 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 he's not going. He's a, <laughs> he's sobbing his heart out. He's sobbing his heart out. I had to put my hand on him and comfort him. It's okay. It's okay, bro. Come boy. And I kept going into Maldi over there. Come on, can't you, boy? <laughs> and uh, so, um, and then a couple of times, I had, we had, I had to wait about two minutes for him to recover himself. And But it touched their hearts. And these are not... Usually, you know, very strict. They don't sort of show the emotions much. So I was really surprised. This guy's just weeping, and all the, the congregations weeping as the Spirit of God just touched hearts, and, and they saw also how they can bring their pain to the Lord, and he can bring healing. And so that was a powerful uh, uh, time at that church. So thank you for your prayers. Um, it's called Christian Faith Center, and uh, we'll see if there's going to be a warrior activist course at that church. And uh, next one, please. And this is the third church. So the first church, this is the father of the son of the first church. He's the father. He's the one that prayed when his, when his found out his son had just been shot by another drug dealer and was uh, on death's door. And uh, so this is the father. And um, uh, so, again, uh, an older, established church. It's been there for decades. They, have a, they used to have their own gym, the big gym. They have a motorcycle ministry. Um, they're just uh, very... Uh, impacting church into the community that just God's just used them and is still using them in their ways and so they have shown interest in a warrior activist course with their people as well again God moved with miracles Michael was my worship leader there so he opened up the whole thing so can we show the for uh clip number two I think it is Chris sorry about that 
And there was a lady there with a sciatic nerve, and she's up the front, she's bending over, she's in pain. And, um, and Jesus, the well, Holy Spirit said, Jesus just healed a lady of a sciatic nerve. And I saw her, she instantly straightened up, and she, wow, ah, ah. She did no idea what's going on. And I said, who is that? She's, it's me, it's me. And she just went running up and down, and that was just fantastic, just seeing <laughs> Jesus. Ah, oh, Jesus. The Holy Spirit, you know, he sees what Jesus took from us. He, he's the only eyewitness that's alive today. All the, all, all the apostles are dead. All the people are dead. But he's the only eyewitness that's alive today. And he, bought, he, he witnessed Jesus take your sin in his own body, literally. See Jesus take your sin. And he saw Jesus take your sickness in his own body. So he bears witness on the earth today. When you gave your life to Jesus, remember that peace you felt when you asked Jesus to take your sin? That was Holy Spirit bearing witness in you, what he saw Jesus do for you 2,000 years ago. He was bearing witness in your soul because he, he saw it, and he will confirm what Jesus did. Well, when he heals you of, your sickness, of any affliction, he saw Jesus take your sickness, your affliction. And when you receive that, he bears witness in your body that you're healed. And what he did with that lady, he just bore witness. Yeah, I saw Jesus take that from you. And he just tells me, Jesus just, he took, just healed somebody. And all I'm doing, I'm just passing on the message. I'm just the messenger boy, and I love being a messenger boy. And, and, and the Holy Spirit just confirms it. Where they say, I can't turn it on and off, fun. I wish I could. I'll be doing it all the time, but I can't. I've just got to go with the flow of what he says. But if he doesn't move that way in the community, in a congregation then we can lay hands on the sick and you'll recover. Either way, God's healing presence will be released to heal people here today. Anyway, so that's number three, number two church. Number three, no, sorry, number three church. Next one, please. Then I flew on down to Houston, Texas to, um, this is Pastor Khan, Dr. Khan Hun. He is from um, Vietnam originally. He, he escaped from the Vietnam War. And um, God has used him to build an amazing church in that area. It's right on the border of, well, it's not actually, it's in, Bo it's in Gangsville. It, it's a dangerous place where the church is, but God's put him there. And um, God is using this Vietnamese people to bring change into their community. They've been there for many years. So uh, Dr. Khan has got an incredible ministry. He just sees signs and wonders and miracles everywhere. Just, he told me of a meeting in 1996 he was at. Get this, this might freak you out. This might think, nah, I heard, I thought, I've heard that testimony somewhere, but I'm hearing it ear to ear, face to face from somebody who was there. He says, a woman came along to the meeting. It was a, it was a prayer meeting of the churches, just joining together for prayer. And this woman came along, and, um, and she had a, a, a child. She was pregnant. And she said, uh, the scan showed that there's a lump on the child's head. And could you pray for the child? Because I, I don't want the baby coming out now with any any uh, melody on it. They said, yeah, we'll pray for the baby. She said, could you also pray for my breasts? They seem to be leaking. Oh, they said, oh, okay, we'll pray for that as well. And so they prayed. And, um, and the, I think there was a doctor with the prayer team, and he did an examination on her. And she said, what's wrong with my breasts? What is it? He said, ah, you're, you're, what do you call it? Laxating? Lactating? Whatever that means, ladies know. And because um, you're having a baby, so you're, you're, you're producing milk. She said, It's impossible. I don't have breasts. I've got silicone. I don't have breasts. I had them cut off. I've got silicone. She says, Nah, you got breasts. She says, Impossible. They went and did tests and they found no silicone. God gave her new breasts. And she had the baby, and the baby's fine. I said, what? He says, yeah, creative miracles. Um, my friend Mike Connell's in Argentina right now. 
Um, the, he, the, in Argentina, they're celebrating the 70th anniversary of the great revivals in Argentina. Those of you who know revivals, there's a guy called Tommy Hicks who went there from America in 1954, my birth date, and uh, God opened the doors and thousands and thousands of Argentinians gave their lives to Jesus. Creative miracles, all the ambulances brought the people and the half-dead people were healed instantly. The ambulances went home empty. And, uh, and so since then, there's been successive revivals in Argentina of millions and millions of people coming to Jesus Christ. And, um, and so they're celebrating the 70th anniversary. And so Mike Connell put on his face post, he said, there's been over 600 um, documented healings or miracles, and there's many creative miracles where they're finding organs inside of uh, people who that were not there before prayer. They're getting these verified medically organs. Creative miracles are breaking out in Argentina. Isn't that good? <laughs> Jesus. So, <laughs> Anyway, so, um, so this is the fourth church I was at, and um, it's a powerful church. They're beautiful people. They love Jesus with all their heart. In August last year, the pastor's son got up and said to Dad, can I say something to the church? He says, yeah, it was Sunday. And he got up and he says, church, um, <clears throat> I feel God wants us to repent. I don't know what of, but he said he wants us to repent. And... Um, the Spirit of God moved upon the people, and they all came forward and began to re or repent before God. And then um, they didn't go home till about 3 o'clock that afternoon. No one wanted to go home because the presence of God just filled the place. In fact, um, they didn't go home. I think they went home about midnight because of the presence of God. And so that was Sunday. So on Monday, they decided to come back to the church Monday night and just to because I was starting a 21 prayer, like us, a 21 day for prayer. So they came back, and the presence of God was there. And they, did, they thought they were only going to do a prayer meeting 7.30 to 8.30, so it went to 12.30. Because nobody wanted to go home because of the presence of God. And every night that's been happening um, up until today. Every night they've been holding prayer meetings in their church, except for when I arrived they had, they had a break for the school break, and it's the only time they've had a break. But every night since August, the uh, meeting in the church, not the whole church, between 80 to 100 people just meeting in the church. They're not pushed there. They just come, and they just stay in the presence of God. And it's been happening since August last year. And they're not advertising it. They don't want to commercialize it. They know God is doing something with them personally. And, um, <coughs> and so that's been happening since August. So there's something happening there. So I sat in there and I sat in through the meetings and I experienced it and I saw what God is doing. It's amazing. Imagine that breaking out here where they say, can we have a prayer meeting on tomorrow night and Tuesday night and Wednesday night and, and we've got 100 people every night. The presence of God is here and no one wants to go. See, that's, that's what God does. So that's what's happening in that church. I've just come out of that church. Next one, please. Uh, I think I'm going to, um, okay, oh, go back to the first. We're going to show that video clip. This is, they have dancers in their church with flags and all that, but these are the only dancers with flags that I think, man, that is good. That's anointed. Some dancers have got their flags and they're whipping their things around and you get to guard your eye, you know. God bless them. Isn't they? Is their expression to Jesus? No judgment here. But <laughs> stay away from me. <laughs> But these guys, they're like martial artists, man. They, and they have different colors for different things. Anyway, I'll just show you a shot of this. Oh, sorry, it might not be the flag one. This is a, this is a Saturday night prayer meeting. So that's been happening every night since August last year. And God was stirring them up. There was a prophet called Chuck Pierce, and he prophesied, and he said God is going to move, move through Houston, Texas, and he's going to move through the Vietnamese because they're more humble than the Americans. That was his words. And, uh, and that's happening in that church. So, uh, Oh, you can do the next one. This, uh, this young girl, her name is Elizabeth. And... Uh, it was four years, four months ago, I was in Houston. 
So that how much time? It's about four years, four months ago. She came up to me and says, oh, I just had to tell you that four years ago, whatever, you prayed for me at a, at a youth camp. I says, oh. She said, uh, I was on my way to the, the youth meeting that you're speaking at, and I got re-ended by an 18-wheeler, and my car got totaled. And she said, you know, miraculously, I didn't get seriously injured, killed or seriously injured, obviously. But she says, my neck, oh, the pain in my neck, it's just bashed something in my neck. And she said, I, I continued to come to the meeting. She's gutsy, eh? Instead of going to the hospital for checking out, she still kept coming to the meeting. Well, she came to the meeting I was preaching at. And I said, I think I remember praying for you. You were crying, surrounded by your friends. She said, that was me. The pain, I said, I don't cry, she said. But the pain was so high, I couldn't stop crying. I was, and I thought, it's going to interfere with my undergraduate studies. And so I prayed for her. She said, nothing much happened. So if you pray for somebody and nothing much happens, okay, it's not the end of the story. And then she said, um, a few days later, you were speaking at our church and you're walking around holding a prayer shawl and you're talking about those who touched the hem of Jesus' garment got healed. And you said that it's not, I'm not Jesus, but Jesus is in me. And he said, the works he did, I will do. And whoever touched Jesus, him, they got healed. So whoever touches this garment reaching out to Jesus in me, he will heal you. So I was walking around, she said, the moment she touched it, all that pain just disappeared, completely left her body. And she said, I haven't been in pain since. That's over four years ago. Completely, miraculously healed. So uh, that, that was one of the miracles of, the many miracles, because I've been there before, and they're telling me this has happened and this has happened. Next one, please. Oh, that was, um, that's um, uh, Josh's leg. Uh, Josh's uh, Natasha and Michael's son, Michael Turner, and I'm, I was hosted with them. And so this happened through rugby. Uh, he was smashed by one of his buddies, a big Tongan boy, and uh, but the buddies, <laughs> but it uh, fractured his whatever that is. So uh, when I was there, I was there for. This has happened a month ago. So this is a month old uh, X-ray. And so they were praying that God would knit it together. And there was, there's a big story about other things they did. They're praying it would knit together. And so when I was there, they said, we're taking him to the doctor in a couple of days, and we're going to check, and we hope that God has healed it. When they took him to the doctor, the doctor says, nah, it hasn't healed after a month of being together. And I remember praying for him. And when I prayed, I saw my mind like God fusing, fusing it together. So... They waited another few days, and they went back to the doctor for more tests or something. And the doctor um, re-did the x-rays and so forth. He says, um, the, the, the break has, gone, has fused itself together. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. God put the thing back together. So Josh has now just got a small cast. He, he gets it off in a couple of weeks, and um, he's able to play rugby again. He'll be able to play rugby again. So, like I say, everywhere I go, I went, I just saw God doing miracles and miracles. The miracles aren't the objective, aren't, aren't my goal, it's Jesus. It's, it's his presence, it's the name, it's Jesus. Just him being lifted up and, and him being reached out to and, and him flowing and the, touching, our pe touching people. Jesus, it's Jesus. He's the healer. I'm no healer. I'm a hose that his presence flows through. I'm a vessel, but he's the healer. You're a vessel but he's the healer that flows through you. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the things I see, that that's part of your destiny as a believer. These signs shall follow them who believe. In my name they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So I told the churches over there, I haven't come to lift my ministry up. I'm not here to lift up Norm McLeod Ministries. I'm not here to lift up House of Breakthrough Ministries. I'm not here to lift up my name, my voice. Or my reputation. I'm honestly, no. I'm here to lift up your ministry, the ministry of the believer, the office of the believer. That's why I'm here. That's the only reason I was in America, is to see if God wants me in this church to be part of serving and to lift up their ministry. But that's my call here too. It is to help you, to help to lift up your ministry, the office of the believer. It's the most underdeveloped and undervalued ministry in the body of Christ in New Zealand is the office of the believer in the realm of the supernatural miracles and healings. Now, 
the office of the believer, there are every there are Christians all through the city, this nation, who are moving in the office of the believer in love and giving, and in many other areas are operating in the office of the believer. You are operating in the office of the believer. But there's a supernatural part of the office of the believer that God wants his people to move in. So it's that part. It's that part of the supernatural that um, is underdeveloped and, and undervalued, and uh, I want to help change that. I believe Jesus has called me, anointed me, and appointed me to help bring change, to lift up the office of the believer, not mine, yours, the church's, the body. Next one, please, final one. Uh, four years, four months ago, that picture there, that's looking out the hotel window <laughs> when I was in Houston four years, four, month, four months ago. And I'll never forget that night was one of the worst nights of my life because we had just found out before I went to Houston to speak at the conference, Kelly's diagnosis. And all through that last night in Houston, I was in prayer all through the night, just prayed all through the night, warfare and so forth. And, and I'll, I'll never forget, it wasn't a nice, it wasn't a pleasant time. <clears throat> And uh, at that time, I was preaching in a revival conference. So on the outside, I yay, yay, yay. And God moved in powerful signs and wonders. But on the inside, I was torn because of what was happening back home, what was happening with our son. <clears throat> so here I am, four years, four months. I didn't even know the dates. I had to ch check my, um, my Facebook and look at the dates to work out. It was four years, four months ago. I was, I'm back in Houston. And I'm looking out a hotel window. And then the Holy Ghost brings back to mind. Remember the last time you looked out a hotel window in Houston? And I did, and it was, ugh. And here we are, four years, four months later, and I'm looking out a hotel window in Houston, and much water has gone under the bridge. We have all experienced different things in our lives. Some have experienced the loss of loved ones, eh? Some have experienced great highs, and some have experienced great lows. Same with this church. In the four years, four months that I was away, the three maiden speakers at this conference four years, four months ago, it was Brent Douglas, me, Jacob Biswell, and the Khan, Dr. Khan's whanau. We have all suffered loss in that four years, four months. We didn't plan it, obviously. <laughs> we wouldn't plan that. But Jacob has suffered loss. <clears throat> Brent has suffered, nearly, nearly died. Dr. Khan, his family, has lost three babies. One was bo born but never lived, and the other were two stillborn. So they have suffered great loss, and we have lost, we lost Kelly. And I think this is strange that over this four years, four months, we have all tasted the bitter cup of suffering and loss. But I'm standing at the window looking out the Houston skyline thinking, I certainly don't feel like I did four years, four months ago. I thank God he's given me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I'm not in denial of the pain or the grief. That I still feel from time to time, but I'm, I've got a healed heart. I'm free, and the Lord says, yes, you're a, I was your bridge over troubled water. I says, what do you want me to preach at this church? He says, I want you to share your testimony of how you and Jess and the family got through this. That will be a bridge over troubled waters for this family who are still grieving. So who plans that? <laughs> I said to Pastor Khan, I said, man, if we knew that was coming our way, we would have said, no thanks, Lord, pass. <laughs> Do it for someone else. But, um, thank you. But we, we couldn't avoid it. It came. And that family, oh my goodness. One of the uh, little babies that died in that family uh, belongs to um, Mike, the youngest son. Mike and Jenny, I think it is. And he's just joined the police force. He's a cop. And the police chief allowed him all the time he wanted to take off to grieve. And he'd only been working for three months. And when it came to the, the funeral of the little boy, they sang uh, the anthem song. And the police chief came and seven patrol cars went ahead of the family and the hearse with all their lights flashing. 
this little boy, God used this little boy to minister, to preach to thousands. And at the funeral, apparently, uh, the police chief said, I've never seen Jesus in this context before. He gave his life back to Jesus, and we've heard of salvations, and incredible things have happened through the grief and the sorrow and the pain. God has brought out life out of death. He always turns it around. So you know, I've heard these stories. And so I shared the te- last Sunday, it was actually last Sunday, I'm sharing about how Jesus took our uh, sorrow and gave us beauty for ashes. And we brought our son, Kelly, in the death and the pain of it. We laid it at the feet of Jesus and said, this is our sacrifice of praise we give to you. We give you a sacrifice of praise. We give you the pain and the suffering. We're not going to take it back. We're not going to go over and over it. We're not going to carry the grief and the pain. He's in paradise. We give you the sacrifice of praise. And he gave us the oil of joy for mourning. It was a transference. So as I'm sharing that with the church in Houston, Texas, Pastor Khan, he's sharing, and the Spirit of God comes upon him. He begins to weep, and his family told me, Daddy's getting healing now. And then the whole family came forward, and they got healing, and many others. And that brings me to the close of this service, that the Lord said to me, what you saw happen at Houston, I want to do here in this service this morning. That there are some people sitting here, and you're still carrying grief, or sorrow, or pain from, it could be a loss, tragic loss of a loved one. For some, I saw it was a loss of finance. It was a, a business deal or something went wrong, and, that, and, and you're grieving, and you're carrying the, the, the bitterness of that, the pain of that, the loss. So it's not just the loss of, you know, the, the greatest loss is uh, losing somebody that you love. That's the greatest loss. But it's also things, things, dreams maybe, um, maybe promises. Maybe somebody betrayed you or you feel like you're being betrayed. And there's a sense of loss, there's a sense of grief there. And, and that's locked into your memory cells. It's locked into your, into your mind. And, you, you, and I tell you what, you'll never get rid of it. It will stay there for the rest of your life. The memory will. And the memory of the pain and the grief of our son, could, it's there. But you know what he took? He took the pain of that memory. He didn't take the memory, but he took the pain. He took the grief. He took the sorrow. And he literally gave us beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for that heaviness. Didn't he, darling? It's true. He did a, a literal exchange in the spirit. And that's why I can stand without crying because he healed us from that window to that window and you might be looking through a window the eyes of the window of the soul and you might be looking through the window or the lens of what happened in your life with great grief but Jesus says I make all things work for good or Paul said that I make all things work for good to those who love me or call according to my purpose and I just want to encourage you if you're carrying something that's been grieving you or, or for years or decades even and it's, it's, the memory is there, but the pain's still there. You haven't transferred it over. You haven't yet transferred it over. Because if you give it to Jesus, yeah, of course, you'll go through the natural grief process. You don't deny the reality of we, we went through that. But the depth of the sorrow where you cannot be consoled, he takes that. He takes it. He takes it, man. So if you're carrying it, he wants to transfer. He wants to give you oil of joy for morning, garment of praise, beauty for ashes. So if you're going to bring something this morning, when you bring it up, as it were, to the invisible altar of the Lord, when you put it on the altar, leave it. When you go to cook something on the barbecue, you put it on the barbie, you don't take it, but you leave it there. Okay. Same with this. You leave it on the altar of the Lord for Jesus. And say, this is my sacrifice to you, Lord. I give you praise and worship regardless of what happened. I'm still going to love you and give you my best. That's the sacrifice of praise. If you do that, he's going to give you something back. You're not going to go back to your seat empty with the hollowness. You're going to go back to your seat with the memory, but the pain is gone. And he's going to give you instead of pain, joy, coming to praise, beauty for ashes. Oh, 
Honestly, I promise you, if you exchange this for Jesus, he's the great exchange happened on the cross 2,000 years ago. And the Holy Spirit is here watching. He's, I saw Jesus take your pain. I'm bearing witness, and I'll be a witness in your soul tonight, today. And I'll be a witness in your body today. When you lay before Jesus as a sacrifice, what you've been carrying, I'm going to be a witness in your soul today that Jesus took it by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, without any further ado, if this message of God, the Holy Spirit, has touched you, and you carrying something, and you want to, you don't know what to do. You don't have to have special words or perfect words or the perfect prayer. I'm not even going to, I'm not going to lay hands on you because this is anything to do with me. It's between you and Jesus. I don't need to pray for you. The greatest one is here, the greatest name. He's the one that takes it. The Holy Spirit is here. So I can lead you in a general prayer, but it's got to be you and Jesus. So if you, if that's you, if you've got something you want to lay at the throne, lay at the feet of Jesus, all the sorrow, all the grief, and give him praise. Say, Lord, I, in spite of this, I'm still going to give you my best. This isn't going to hold me back. By your grace, I'm going all the way because you're worth it. That's you? No, my, I don't mind. Just come on down and, and let the Holy Spirit minister to you now. Just feel free to come down. <laughs>